I'm just rearranging my studio a little bit, uh, getting canvases off the floor onto stretchers, uh, looking at things that I've done anyway, uh, taking a small period of uh, thought and time on an interesting subject. I came across Terence McKenna's Opening the Doors of Creativity, a lecture, an uh, hour and 40 minute lecture he gave regarding creativity and I'm at the beginning of it and have been listening to it and I thought I'd comment. And it, it relates to the politic of aesthetics. I did about a, a week ago or so, if you look back, the politics of aesthetics. Now I'm going to uh, let Terence McKenna say a few things and then I'll have a comment and it relates to the, to the uh, little video I did based on what I believe to be functioning in terms of what makes art important or not. What is it that in people's minds has established a sense of importance around this thing making art. Now Terence McKenna has a history. I've actually not read any of his books but I've heard him. He's got long lectures on video and I'm going to research him a little bit more. He's, uh, he was more of like this uh, guy who liked to get loaded on uh, mind-expanding drugs and uh, experimented with this side of our uh, existence and came up with a lot of really fascinating conclusions and thoughts or ideas and one of them is this creativity thing which I'm very interested in. What is it that makes the creative mind, the creative spirit and I'm gonna try to keep this short. might actually end up longer because it's a long thing as I get through and I I'm going to pick stuff out. Listen to him uh, start off here. Nature's creativity is obviously the wellspring of human creativity. We emerge out of nature almost, and this idea I think was fairly present close to the surface of the medieval mind, we emerge out of nature almost as its finest work of art. Uh, the, the medieval mind spoke of the productions of nature. This is a phrase you hear as late as the 18th century. The productions of nature. And human creativity uh, emerges out of that, whether you have a model of the Aristotelian um, great ladder of being or a more modern evolutionary view where we actually uh, consolidate emergent properties Evolution. and somehow bring them to a focus of self-reflection. All right, so he starts off by talking about the fact that we come out of a concept based in pre-Renaissance medieval notions of creativity. We, we are grounded in a concept that goes back to the Middle Ages pre-Renaissance which I mentioned in my politic of aesthetics that I have a great deal of reservation around the Renaissance because there is a level of bravura that is not part of my making art. It's, it's when I make paintings I'm not concerned, at least not anymore, maybe if I ever really was, concerned about the bravura or the sort of uh, dazzling feeling about something. It is part of it. There is a magic feeling but in the Renaissance it became uh, and he'll refer to this as well as the dominance of the rational mind and this is where I parted. I, I enjoy looking at older representations, the Middle Ages uh, people, the way they saw their world and connected to that larger self. So he has now identified this part, this idea of coming creativity out of a mindset rooted in uh, the universe at large. Not like coming out of our mind but we are connected to a much larger thing, the Aristotelian thing, the ladder or whatever that is. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. We, we climb the ladder into consciousness or whatever. So we'll let, I'm going to pause now and connect with this again. Now the, the next segment he continues and identifies the original artist basically. Listen to this. Now I'm sure that we couldn't carry out a discussion of this sort without observing that the prototypic figure 
for the artist as well as for the scientist is the shaman. The shaman is the figure at the beginning of human history that unites the doctor, the scientist, and the artist into a single notion of caregiving and creativity. I like that. I like that. Care giving. Care giving and creativity. So he has now identified uh, uh, an individual, uh, an archetypal character called the shaman who relates to the tribe, the people about him, as a caregiver. Lovely. Let me just pause for a second and we'll get to the next stage. So now he continues to describe what has occurred since we've given up this connection to our uh, larger being, the environment, the birds, the, the trees, the stars, the shamanic vision of the planet is connected to all the things that are around us and feed us and give us and the shaman returns this by caregiving and giving back. Now, he says there has been a breakdown in this and it starts with the Renaissance as far as I'm concerned and continues through the rationalism and uh, you know the, the classical period embraces all this rationalism and uh, it sort of begins to break down in there were probably always pockets you know you've got Greco uh, you know those mannerist types that were producing work which doesn't follow the, uh, the formula and there are always people in there but in general humanity has developed come through a period of intense rationality and based on the renaissance perception of the world you know perspective everything has a mechanical a scientific notion attached to it so anyway now he talks a little bit about how this has been breaking down Let, let's see what he has to say I think that, you know, to whatever degree art over the past several centuries has wandered in the desert, it is because this shamanic function has been either suppressed or forgotten. And we've, uh, different images of the artist have been held up at different times. Uh, the artist as uh, artisan, the artist as a uh, handmaiden of a ruling class or family. The oligarchs. The artist as designer for the production of integrated objects into a civilization. Uh, this <laughs> Fantastic. Beautiful. And you take that through into the present in, into our present state of affairs that the artist has become a kind of peripheral designer. Uh, whether it's, you know, uh, for the most part, there is a, what I call a regurgitation. And this regurgitation is literally part of that design concept that uh, what are called creative people are merely taking things that have existed and worked and reapplying it to their environment and make a buck. You know, it's come down to the, you know, trying to make a buck. Not that a lot of them actually make a buck, but they continue and persist in producing things that are design oriented, artisan. Even though it looks way out there, it's not really. It's not really because that connection, or maybe it's a form of imitation that they imitate that shamanistic thing, but it's really broken down into a design complex. Now I'll pause again and see what he has to say. Let me pause. Continuing now, he's going to explain this breakdown, why it has occurred. Listen to this. Uh, this notion of the artist as mystical journeyer, as one who goes into a world unseen by others and then returns to tell them of it, was pretty much lost in the post-medieval uh, and Renaissance conception of art up until the late 19th century or early 20th century, where beginning with the Romantics, there is a new permission to explore the irrational. This really is 
the bridge back to the archaic shamanic function of the artist. Her Now that's a beautiful insight. It's a beautiful, beautiful insight that brings us right back to the core of what it is that any artist would actually be in essence. Uh, that sense of connectedness to something and then passing it on, whichever way uh, that can be accomplished. Now here is a little bit more. The sound uh, gets a little bit worse, uh, but let's listen to what he has to say. Uh, it's interesting. And this is 200 years, the ostensible mission, the mission of the artist has been to test the conceptual and imagistic envelope of what the society is willing to tolerate. And this has taken many forms. The uh, deconstruction of imagery that we get with abstract expressionism going back into impressionism and the pointless. Or uh, the permission for the irrational imagery of the unconscious, surrealism, and, uh, and German expressionism make use of this permission. Always the idea being to somehow destroy the idols of the tribe. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Destroy the idols of the tribe. Don't give in to the conformity of the tribe because essentially the tribe functions as a, an addendum to the vision of the shaman. So the, as, as long as the, uh, you know, what we consider to be functioning civilization, which is why McKenna has always said civilization or culture is not your friend if you're an artist. Now the, the one thing that uh, you know, he, he brings in now abstract expressionism, obviously the deconstruction of the tribe was started with, as he says, the symbolists. I, I think it started before that in, in art, like I mentioned, uh, Greco never uh, bought into the, uh, the tribe's vision of the world, you know, his elongated bodies. I, I find those quite extraordinary. Uh, it's one of the few artists from that period that, that excites me uh, to the extent that you know, I get excited by the classics and the mannerists and, you know, the, he's sort of attached to the Renaissance to some extent. But uh, now he brings in this deconstruction of uh, uh, our conscious awareness. What we think is important is being ruined by these artists, the Dadaists, Duchamp, uh, people that, uh, you know, Hülsenbeck, the poets, the sound poets, people that deconstruct our world in essence and uh, you know he probably sees abstract expressionism as a kind of uh, flagship of this deconstruction in a sense you know coming I, I have I have reservations about that uh, because I see I see a lot of uh, conformity in in some of that work and uh, conformity it, that's a whole other thing I okay anyway I do appreciate that period of uh, art as well um, now my thing, my thing here is McKenna is someone who experienced this phenomenon of specifically art, visual art. Now he's across the board, music, dance, opera, poetry, literature, visual arts is like right he's he's sort of like a an encapsulator of all of this my my mission my mission on this planet is as a painter as a painter i have a link a direct link to that sense of otherness not uh destroying the tribe now for me what is really important and crucial in this experience as a painter as a visual artist is to take something that is, as he says, irrational, appears irrational, and fit it into some kind of format that is uh, a nutrient form, a caregiver, uh, nurturing to those that see it. And this is my specialty, my expertise as a painter. I, other painters have, uh, you know, accomplished this obviously very well. And uh, in my particular form, it has taken a form that I even see in a sense almost like 
myself as an outsider. I look at the work that uh, I'm making and I realize that this is not part of the world that we've known before. There are uh, very distinct elements, absolutely unequivocally distinct to whatever has happened in visual expression before. And this is confirmed by Terence McKenna and the idea of shamanism. And I may make another video. I'll leave it out here. Otherwise, it'll get too long. But you get the idea. It's, it's quite beautiful, isn't it?